Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Simon Jenkins. I'm chairing this evening. Uh, I uh, knew Roger uh, quite well, not very well, um, but it's a huge honor to be uh, here chairing something in his honor. Um, he, uh, he was, as I'm sure many of you know, a, a controversialist. Um, he was a wonderful person to argue with. And I think he was one of the nicest people to disagree with. Um, he, 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 I, I never enjoyed disagreeing with anyone so much as disagreeing with Roger. Um, uh, but he was also, as you all know, a great lover of beauty. Uh, and he, uh, he was an emotional lover of beauty, which was um, as, as, as opposed to an intellectual lover of beauty. And I last knew him when he was um, uh, trying to help out the government um, on how buildings should look. A thankless task, if ever I could have imagined one. Um, but I have to say, um, we, we, we sat on a committee for a brief period of time. Um, uh, it was very sad that he departed before he could really um, push through what he wanted to do. But about two weeks ago, uh, I don't know how many of you noticed, uh, Michael Gove turned down a Barclay Homes housing estate in Kent on the grounds that it was ugly. Uh, this apparently had never, had never happened before, and the um, architects were appalled, the developers were astonished, um, some of us were delighted, um, but I have a feeling that was Roger. <laughs> um, and it's so nice that, 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 that one of his, one of his um, commemorations um, is housing estate being turned down because it was ugly. I just hope it stays that way. Um, now, tonight we've got um, Paul Lay, who's um, co-discussing uh, with me um, Alexander Stoddard's um, uh, lecture. Um, he's a historian, distinguished historian um, of the 17th century in particular, um, and editor of my favorite magazine, or was editor of my favorite magazine, History Today. Um, now, uh, Alexander Stoddart is um, really our most distinguished uh, sculptor. Um, I did come across him once before. I don't think we met, but um, I had, uh, was asked to do in desperation by someone goodness knows why, to review the most difficult book I've ever reviewed, which was a, a, a catalogue of statues in the streets of Edinburgh. Um, uh, and it's one book in which he features very prominently. Um, he's a controversialist, I think he, he, he'd agree with me to say. Um, he, has, uh, he doesn't mind having a good argument about something. Um, he's my favourite sort of sculptor. He sculpts things I can recognise. Uh, and, um, and he uh, believes passionately, I think, in, in the, um, the character of a traditional statue. Um, more than that, uh, he's a genuine conservationist. His instruction, I discovered from this book, under a statue of, of the great uh, Scottish scientist Maxwell, is, is um, please look after this statue, but above all else, never touch the bird droppings. That, to me, is a real conservationist. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Simon. Um, can you all hear me if I speak like this? Good. Here we go. It's ter terrific to be in this environment. What a building. It's exactly how lecture theatre should be. If rhetoric is the thing that we're dealing with today, then we should have a rhetorical visual culture as well. Um, you can just hear how brilliant the sound works in a great auditorium like this even if this doesn't work. Oh, here we go, right, this is us now. Great, right, you see now, this is what Roger Scruton would have called a dim religious light. Uh, it gets shadows in and that makes everything brighter. And it also makes everything intellectually brighter because as he said, in architecture, classical architecture, many shadows, they're called shades, are cast. And shades, said Roger, are where the gods live. Coming from the west of Scotland, I'd say they're where the fairies live. There's a subtle, we have a, a habit of usage of the gods in that sense. This is a wee god here that I made about six years ago. It stands in the back of the big statue in Edinburgh of William Henry Playfair, Edinburgh's most fastidious classical architect. He's the one that does all the big temple buildings in the centre of the city. And it's a figure of sleep, the god Hypnos, the god of sleep, who just happens to be my, my patron deity, my genius. You know, the word genius in the ancient world doesn't mean a guy with big hair and a bad attitude. It means your genius is your personal god. You put up a lararium to him or her. It's always a boy, actually. Winged boy. 
and you have to pay attention to your genius and offer him offerings, and he'll look after you. We can Christianize as your guardian angel. So my genius has always been the god Hypnos, and this is the Hypnos of uh, Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, when he said in his great essay on spirits and spirit seeing, he was interested in going to sleep. He would always try to watch himself going to sleep and try to get round the corner of the falling asleep bit. But of course, he always fell asleep at that point, so it never really worked. And he said, you lie there thinking of the disaster of the day that's been and your fears for the day to come. And then all of a sudden, a thought or image will come into your head that you haven't planned. And once you, once you follow that, then you'll be into sleep. So hypnos comes with strange, unexpected images. And Schopenhauer says, for instance, it can be anything completely random. It could be the treetops, see the leaves there, or it could be a line of sh soldiers, or a woman with a basket on her head. What was the point of this on the back of a statue of a classical architect? It was to show that classical architecture and classical art generally, classicizing traditional art, has ultimately a narcotic and soporific effect upon the viewer. This is what distinguishes art from modern art, which is so very different. Modern art is highly stimulative, agitative, it's forward-looking, air-punching, noisy, ugly, and cruel. <laughs> Why do I just say what I mean? <laughs> uh, whereas classical art is, above all, uh, a soporific kind of d uh, um, dish. It's sedative. It's a lullaby, and for this reason, high and dynamic thrusters just don't like it. So Hypnos is there because Playfair's architecture in Edinburgh puts everybody to sleep. It sings a visual lullaby, and all the revolutionaries can't stand this, and that's what distinguishes classicism as a conservative idiom from the high dynamism of um, leftism. That's why the movies are associated as the art form of the political left. But we don't do that. We do the stillies. They stand still and do nothing 24-7, 365. I started trying to make a statue or image of Hypnos when I was a wee boy at art school. Um, and this was the head here. You see, it's just a survival from the middle of last century, frankly. And uh, you know, no idea how terrifying it was to start making that little head. I felt that the force, the cosmic sprite was against me. I really had to do it almost secretly and covertly. And I was modeling this in clay. This is a plaster cast, you understand, but the, the original model is in clay. And for some reason, I thought I would be safer if I ritually mutilated it. And so I modeled the nose off it. Can you believe that? So I imitated a glyptic effect, which is the effect of a hammer on stone, using wet mud. And I thought, if, if I do that, ritually humiliate the thing, then the, the powers will forgive me. It was an early feeling of fundamental transgression to begin to try to make a thing like that. I mean, I was at art school, and I'd been making pop rivet, riveted bits of metal and all that stuff and getting rave reviews from it from my tutors. Cardboard boxes, you know, the usual rubbish. And then I thought, I'll secretly go, go and do this, and I'd better just mutilate it a wee bit, because then they'll like me and they'll forgive me. And of course, I was much under the influence of Auguste Rodin, because it was really easy. If you're Rodin, you, you don't really quite know how to model a knee in this position. So you just cut it off. And also, you know, the shoulder. It's such, and then he'll tell you, Rodin will tell you, he was a lying toad. He'll tell you that what this represents is the equivalent of Caravaggio, chiaroscuro, you know? So this part here is where the figure disappears into the darkness, like Caravaggio. It's such rubbish. Basically, he knows that he can get a thing made quickly um, and easily without t the terrible problem of error. And in this, he follows on, and this is going to be a strange ju juncture here, a tradition of charlatanry that goes way back even into great antiquity that we associate with sculptors. I mean, our reputation professionally is really bad. We're awful people. 
Michelangelo, you see, he's doing this. This is his greatest work, the Medici chapels. But you see how he leaves the face uncut like that. As a young man, I thought that was magisterial. It just looked like the sun, giorno, the day. And a lot of people love this. Why do they love it? Because, you see, the thing hasn't reached an end yet. There's no terminus to it. It's still going. You're almost getting behind the scenes to see the process in action. And folk love that. People come to my studio and say, oh, I just love the process, the process. We're well, not interested in the process. Look at the thing. He's even, you can tell just by looking at him from his face that he's up to no good. I mean, he's responsible. He's responsible for the most egregious um, misleading of the general public. The public understanding of sculpture is rock bottom. We understand more about ectoplasm than we understand about sculpture. And it was by Vasari and Michelangelo in tandem, the pair of them, working to plot to make the legend of Il Divino, the divine Michelangelo, that caused so much difficulty for us all to this day. See, people say to me, are you still doing the old And I say, no, no. I'm modelling clay, it looks like this. It's a sculptor's face I've got on, you know, sculpture face. Wet mud, silent, they walk away from you because it's not glamorous. You remember that in India, in the Hindu tradition, the Dalits, you know, the untouchables, are the potters, the guys that work with clay. So for this reason, Michelangelo knows that he will suppress his preparatory models. And they were systematically suppressed to give the impression that he, Il Divino Michelangelo, can just walk up to the block of marble and with his X-ray eyes, see through the mere material, they're all Platonists, you know, through the mere materials into the encased figure, trapped and imprisoned within. They're also all Republicans, so it's this Fidelio kind of culture. And of course, what he's doing is he's making models, but suppressing them. They never survived. Whereas the true sculptors, like the neoclassicists, loved their preparatory models. So for this reason, nobody knows anything about how to make sculpture nowadays, and Michelangelo starts that. Then he also does something different. And this is really, I think, verging on evil. One of his very late works, the Rondonina Pieta. He started to carve it, um, and then he starts to destroy it, cut back through it. He wants to sink the figure way back. But he's already carved a very fine arm there of the previous figure in that block. So what he's doing now is making an, an, a, a, a starved and flinty image in favour of something that looks actually rather well cut. See the difference in culture between that fragmentary arm and the rest of it. And he's carefully left that fragmentary arm hanging there as evidence of his heroic act of destruction. See, it's easy to get rid of that completely. It's the job of a morning. But no, he has to leave it there to show that he is a killer. And so he actually involves himself in an iconoclastic gesture right in the midst of his own work. We see evidence of iconoclasm everywhere. See, this is not fair wear and tear, this damage. It's systematically pursued by hordes of people starting in the fourth century AD, third, fourth century AD, um, you, know, you know about uh, Palmyra, it was revisited, almost exactly identical items of vandalism done. So this here is what we see, the sorry wreck of the, the great work of Papa Phidias. I don't understand why the Greeks want it back. Look at it. I mean, <laughs> if, if Pericles came back and saw this in Greece and saw the wreck of the Acropolis, He'd say, who are your Persian overlords? Because obviously, this physical wreck, the Acropolis, is evidence that Greece is no more. So what they should do is, uh, we can keep these, and I'll make a, a new set. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you see, this is like Greece coming along, Greece the peripatetic entity, you know? You never thought that Paisley, west of Scotland, could supply such a thing. It's not a country, you understand, or a time. 
Greece is a tendency and it is peripatetic. It crops up in the strangest places at the strangest times. Um, yeah. This is an interesting thing. Now, we're talking about iconoclasm and how things get busted and put together again. Well, King Ludwig I of Bavaria, you, you've all heard of Ludwig II with Maximilian II in between the two. Ludwig II is the one that saves, saves Wagner for us. But his grandfather, Ludwig I, was a great um, friend of sculpture and built a glyptotech in Munich. And he had to acquire some really first-class classical work. So he got the Aegina marbles uh, and assembled them within the glyptotech, means a library that holds the things that are glyptically produced. Glyptic meaning carved and cut. Haptic is modelling in clay. I'm a, I'm a hapticist. But this is glyptic work, and it's in the severe style. It's just before Phidias. It becomes the first step on anatomical accuracy. And of course, because he's a man of great culture and distinction, and understands that maybe thousands of years separate them and several hundreds of miles, nevertheless, the tendency can still be applied that you put the pieces up and you, you commission Bertolt Torvaldsen the greatest artist alive at the time, you commission him to make up the, remo the, the missing parts. And thus you get a perfect sense of the sparse and glorious arrangement. And Torvaldsen even changed his own style for this and imitated the archaic manner or the severe style manner. That seems to me to be a marvelous gesture that despite all the destruction, all the time, all the space between them, Antiquity and modernity can work hand in hand. That seems to me culture. Culture being a relationship between the living and the dead, and as Roger Scruton pointed out, the, the metaphysical companions of the dead over there in the noumenon, the yet to be born. That's what culture is, a triadic relationship. You can see that they've demonstrated how much better it is now, okay, because that's the image of the original ruin. That's the coloured version at the top would indicate what kind of colours were used in this. And when we talk about the, later about the anger that people feel when they see classical, certain people feel, they often um, protest about the whiteness of it. Uh, Didn't the Greeks always colour their statues? They say in the most angry tone. I've got a psychological answer for that. We'll, we'll come up with it later. So then... The righteous 20th century, later 20th century comes along and says, oh no, Torvaldsen's 19th century editions that complete everything and make it all sensible. Uh, no, no, they, they're inauthentic. What's really much more authentic is this shambles. And so in a kind of inverted and sanctimonious piety, they systematically, but obviously not with hammers this time, but they, they, they reenact the ruin. And with this, they smugly sit, and somebody will say, it has a certain new dynamic to it. This culture of the fragment, this love, this comfort that we get of the thing coming and going, coming or going. Whereas the completed object is going nowhere and coming nowhere. So this is the problem, that here we have a movie in action and the promise of destruction. Now... I want to talk to you, I'm conscious of time here. I've got about 15 minutes left or so. I want to talk to you about the big struggle that artists have. So how is it that everybody says, oh, he was a struggling sculptor, but nobody says, oh, he was a struggling butcher. The idea is that the artist is doing something fundamentally naughty, okay? And for that reason, he's got to be a failure, that's his punishment. He's got to be underground. He can't be president of the Royal Academy, for instance. So, literally underground, perhaps, because this is ancient stuff from way back. And it doesn't occur to people, why is it painted in caves? These marvellous drawings, it's so kind of accurate looking. It's painted in caves because the people that are doing it are frightened for their lives, that they'll be caught. They're strictly underground artists. What are they doing? They're representing nature. Representing representing nature. And nobody really likes to be caricatured or represented. And nature, to personify her, uh, just like that exactly. 
Now, the idea that the artist should be a hounded creature uh, and that there is an iconophobic or iconoclastic tendency right through culture is found everywhere. We think of it amongst the Abrahamic peoples first, but it's everywhere else. Take the Spartans, for instance, ancient Sparta. One poet, we think, and one scabby wee bit sculpture. Alcman was a very good poet, mind you. Uh, and then this is uh, Edgar Degas' uh, picture of the Spartan girls challenging Spartan boys. They like sport, you know. Uh, so the Spartans, well, King Agesilaus, right? In, in the decadence of Sparta, King Agesilaus is told that a buffoon, they called all actors buffoons in Sparta, that a buffoon had arrived in the Agora and was imitating the sound of the nightingale and he should come down and, see, and hear this. And Agesilaus said to his servant, why should I come and hear some buffoon whistling away when I can hear the song of the nightingale herself? So Agesilaus is not interested in the imitation of the effect. It seems to me that imitation of the effect is central to all arts. Theatre, for instance, take, a, take that. So the Spartans don't like it. Then there's Plato's mob. Well, they're like you know, these communists that admired Soviet Russia all these years, uh, from the safety of Oxford and Cambridge and places like that. They all admire Sparta, but they're in Athens. It's, it's, it's a comfy. This is a startling picture, isn't it? This is by Jean Delville, the most sick puppy of the sick puppy symbolists. You know, Belgian to the core. <laughs> he taught at Glasgow School of Art and a beloved teacher. So the Platonists don't like it because of the old thing, you know, it's a representation of a representation. As Bertrand Russell said, Plato would be quite at his ease on Zion whereas Plotinus would be on his best behaviour. <laughs> so, and then we've got Scottish Presbyterians to join in with this behaviour. So that's the famous John Knox. You can see the Taliban hat that he's got there. It's all in the hat, I find. Well, this is his greatest work, the appalling ruins of St Andrew's Cathedral, the ruination of which he personally directed it was encrusted with statuary and Im images everywhere. And he's the very type that would rail against the image. He gives rise to a si uh, situation in Scotland, which, I mean, I know all about. This is Lorimer's fabulous painting of the ordination of the elders in the Church of Scotland in the 19th century. These are the old lichts of the um, great disruption of the Church of Scotland in 1843. There's a young elder. Presbyterianism, as you know, comes from the Greek word presbyteros, meaning the old man. So when you have to do this, when you're reading, you always put that face on for some reason. That's called presbyopia, the way the old man sees. So Presbyterianism is the rule of the church by the old men. Uh, so I, I actually personally come out of this culture. It was the Baptist side of things, way up in the north of Scotland. Uh, we didn't really have any terribly developed visual culture up there. Uh, but um, my father was very good in bringing me forward and because he himself had been frustrated as a wannabe artist. So, now, then we got the modern age coming along with Jackson Pollock here. They've done away with representation altogether. In fact, they study to make sure there's nothing can be seen in this mess. You know, we intend, we, we intend when we see a certain cloud to interpret a face within it, uh, or the embers in the fire. Well, they're actually working against that. If that happens, then the work is deemed a failure. So he's slobbing about here, and th this is all funded by the CIA. <laughs> oh, it's true, as a prophylactic to show how marvelously free, <laughs> Right, that's, that's freedom for you, you see? Slop, black, splash. How marvelously free the West is compared with the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact countries, who are painting pictures like this. Now, honestly, in your heart of hearts, in the dark night of your soul, when a wee angel comes down and says, son, do you want to paint like this? <laughs> or like this, I can make it happen either way, big man. You know perfectly well what you're going to do. And, I mean, he was a perisher, of course. But what stupendous picture. Does it not tell you something true about that revolution? The covered seats. 
terrifying brilliance by a painter called Brodsky. Well, the, so the contemporaries don't like image making. They work against it. And then within the science community, there's also a, a terrific anxiety. I made the statue of uh, James Clark Maxwell, you know, the, the man who unified the whole electromagnetic um, thing. And, and uh, it was commissioned by the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is a highly scientized body. Uh, it's inconceivable that a poet would be the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh now, as was Walter Scott in his time. It's all science-based. And I made this statue in the teeth of opposition from a certain faction within the Royal Society of Edinburgh who were dead against the thing. Absolutely out of the question. We don't want statues. What we want is a big block of granite. This is the way they speak, you know. A big block of granite with beautiful equations inscribed upon it. And I'm thinking to myself, you've got a problem here with the public reception of science. What a boring thing that would be. It's sheer elitism. And then, of course, I made the tremendous error saying four beautiful equations. I don't think they're that beautiful, frankly. They're, they're hack it. They're all jaggy with mixed up Greek, Latin, no symmetry to speak of. And then, this is the interesting thing, that beauty is allowed nowadays in science. Whereas if you say the word beauty at art school, you'll be failed, kicked out. <laughs> Uh, mocked by your tutors and failed, you know, absolutely. You'll be ostracized. And you think I'm joking, but I'm not. So, yeah, and the dress sense is a disaster as well. No, okay. And then we have the iconoclasm of the conceptualist. Now, the conceptualist will employ figure work, representational art, but he'll impose upon it his signs and symbols. So this is a bust of Tiberius that has stood probably for a time with a cross cut by a Christian zealot uh, and then toppled finally. It's in the British Museum. So it's a basalt stone. And uh, what we see in this work here by the poetaster and philosophaster, the late Ian Hamilton Finlay, uh, the con uh, conceptual, oh, he's a concrete poet, really. Uh, you can see here that there's a head of the monstrous sidekick to uh, Maximilien Robespierre, the odious Louis Antoine de Saint Just, the barrier, you know, the barrier of the French Revolution. And he constructs this monstrous individual uh, as the god Apollo and has in French, Apollon Terroriste, written across the forehead. And in this way, the word comes to qualify the image. I made this piece for him, God forgive me. <laughs> but I was desperate, because I'd come out of art school, and there was nobody touching me with a barge pole, because I was like, and I've always said this, it's a very strange analogy. If the contemporary art establishment, you know the commissars, the mandarins, embrace me, then I am like a sheet of medicated toilet paper going into the septic tank. Remember Eisel? You can't use it if there's a septic tank because it, it counteracts the septic reaction. So it does away with it. Take on board these things that I'm saying and suddenly everything becomes under question. Well, that's what happened to me anyway. So that's a shocker. It's the most popular image at Little Sparta, the garden of earthly delights that is in Lanarkshire in Scotland. He's absolutely adored by the contemporary art establishment. Students at art schools are forced fed thinly, like making foie gras, because he brings the word to counter the image. Now, I'm moving on very swiftly. What? are the roots that clutch what branches grow out of this sturdy rubbish, son of man. You cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats, etc., etc. I'm convinced Eliot saw this picture. It's a composed picture of stuff that's been found and assembled. It's a very famous figure bearing a calf there, archaic work. And then this interesting piece, which we'll come to just before the end. 
Okay, we start with the Abrahamic peoples. And it's a very fascinating thing because you will find a truth if you resort to mythology, in this case, Hebrew mythology. I don't use the word mythology in the pejorative or dumbed down sense. If a thing's a myth, to me, it's more likely to be much more true than what you read in the papers. Mythology is the monumentalizing of stories that are so important they have to have, as it were, a massive presence on the horizon. So when I say Hebrew mythology, I'm saying the way the Hebrews tell the truth about something. You know the old story in Exodus? Moses is leading the poor children of Israel out of captivity through this desert. Moses becomes the sort of principle of the perpetual motion idea of the forward march of history. The original kind of Trotskyite, the potential for the revolution never to finish. That's why he never reaches the promised land. He dies in Mount Nebo within sight of the promised land. But it's impossible to somebody like Moses arriving at the promised land put his feet up. It's just out of the question. So he has to die. And the poor children of Israel have been traipsed across the desert by this man for decades. Then he says he's going up the hill to speak to God. And so the children of Israel... They stop as he goes, thank Christ for that. Well, you don't say that, obviously. Uh, and they say, thank, thank goodness, uh, a bit of peace, you see. And what they do first is they dig a hole, make a, a foundation, build a wee pedestal, and then make a piece of sculpture. How nice is that? And that's what's happening here is they're stopping. They're giving up on the forward motion, the, the constant thrust. Um, and some say that they dance around it in a circle. That's a way of getting nowhere. So Moses then comes down off the mountain with the brief. It's a fairly restricted brief. The first commandment is just an intro. But when he gets into the meat of the commandments, which is the second one, you shall make no sculptures. What have they just been doing? It's an amazing coincidence. So... You see, I'm going here. Right? So Moses then gets his Levites to round up 3,000 men, women, and children who have been involved in this public arts project and puts them all to death, directly countermanding the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, <laughs> except if it's sculptors. What's, what's really... You make a, a special exception to that. So this is the first instance where the image is opposed by the word. The two things clash. My mother is a person of the word. I often think she doesn't quite see what I do. It's a visual cacophony to her. My father, on the other hand, was a man of the image. He saw absolutely everything. So it is a kind of division of type between people. Some folk are like that and some aren't. So that's the first collision of the concept with the percept. Because the percept is the calf. It's always called the molten calf, by the way, not the golden calf. And the concept is what comes down in words, because as Schopenhauer says, the word is the handmaiden of the concept. She's a very, very assiduous Ancilla, and uh, she often gets in the way of the image, just like in the last image that I showed you. But what's also interesting is this, that Moses comes down off the mountain, and I don't care what the scholars say. He comes down off the mountain bearing horns. They didn't like that. So they say it's, it's rays, it's a, mis a translational mistake. But it suits my argument to stick with the horns. Because look at this. This is Klaus Schluter's account. A fabulous image. Look at the rounded, butty horns. It's amazing Go German Gothic work, Franco-German Gothic work. And of course it's perfect, isn't it? Because in this con con contretemps between... The, the, the sculpture and the man, Moses, they lock horns, literally. Moses' horns are real horns, but the horns and the calf are sculpted. They're depictions of horns. And this is why it's so neat to maintain the horns, and it's the first instance of the situation where we have conceptual art like this with found objects. So Moses' horns are the objet trouvé, and the horns on the beast, the, the, the sculpture, are the depicted horns. It's necessary that these two things occur, because otherwise we've all been, he I mean, we have all been heading to the marvellous axis of evil <laughs> between Marcel Duchamp's exhibited toilet and Tracy Emin's bed. 
It's a shocker. So this is the problem. that He's not painting a picture of the urinal. He's exhibiting the urinal itself. This is surely the triumph of the image, uh, of the object over the image. It is the end of art, literally. But it, it's possible to draw and paint unmade beds. This one here is by Géricault, the French romantic painter. And this is by Adolf von Menzel, the German romantic. And you see, they take the, make the effort to do the drawing, to do the imitation. What is it about this imitation that we, oh, I'll just look at this again. You see, it's very like an unmade bed, but it's not entirely like it. It's not like a photograph. It's done with a wee accent of some sort. There's something in there. It's called style. And that's one of the reasons why impersonators, impressionists like Rory Brenner are funny, because they get it so closely, but it's not just quite right. And this gives us a tickle, the detachment from the print, as you might say. OK, well, we've had a lot of action over the last few years in respect of indignation about statuary. I'm coming to the end now. This is the final five minutes. George Square in Glasgow, the first stat, a monument to Walter Scott made there. And uh, you know, we've got Robert Burns, Sir John Moore of Corona. Not a drum was heard, not a funeral note. You know the poem. As his corpse from the rampart we hurried. And then Lord, Robert, uh, Lord Clyde here. Cenotaph by J.J. Burnett, who extended the British Museum. And uh, the, mar the marvellous Glasgow city chambers. So it was the scene of some anger. I kept my head down and said not a word. That wasn't easy. But the interesting thing was, as you can see here, the crowds ta tackled Robert Peel uh, most of all. They completely ignored Lord Clyde, who suppressed the Indian mutiny. Right? <laughs> Peel actually stood up for reform and the repeal of the Corn Laws so that the poor folk could actually get something to eat. I suppose he did found the Rosers, and that might have annoyed them. <laughs> and there was, of course, parental interest in, in the plantations. <laughs> but the, the, the fascinating thing was that Roberts was sitting right just across the square and absolutely bang on for targeting. So what saved Roberts? Well, I'll tell you what I think it is. You see, oh, sorry, the crowd wants to lynch the figure. But it doesn't also want to lynch a palm tree, because the palm tree gets in the place, in, in the way of the effect of the festive cruelty of the hanging. But Robert Peel here has no att attributes around him. Therefore, that toppled is more like a man, but just a man toppled. You know how when you were a kid, you had toy soldiers they're running along and they've got a piece of earth attached to them. You see them in Toy Story, that famous Pixar film. Do you know there's, there's soldiers, they're heroes, and they're all struggling along with these bits of earth <laughs> underneath, you see? We always feel so sorry for them. We always wish that we could have snipped that off, but then they wouldn't stand. It's the same thing with this here. Likewise, I've noticed that seated figures are very much safer than standing ones. If you want to stop fighting with somebody, the best plan is to sit down for a kickoff. Uh, you know, that's a really great idea. So seated figures, and I've done many of them in my time, they're very hard to do, but they're safer than the standing up ones because they're not in a position to fight and resist. Uh, that's T Thomas Graham. They want to take them all down, of course. This is James Watt. Well, he's guilty of the Industrial Revolution. Thomas Graham, yeah, he invented the chemistry that backs up... Um, What's that blood treatment thing? Dialysis. Dialysis. But they want to take it down because it's an imperialist monster. Right, so, anyway. Uh, well, this is work I've done in the past. This is my assistant, Lindsay, here, full time. Uh, and this is my third Adam Smith statue. It was going to Dallas in America, companioned with a figure of Aristotle. And this is where I started it all with the David Hume Monument on the High Street of Edinburgh. Uh, the, you know, the, the toe gets polished up there. I would personally put 360 volts through the thing. You know, that, that would be enough. But then again, 
we, we remark that David Hume, the patron saint of atheists, would find it very amusing and ironic that his toe is getting kissed away by a billion pilgrim lips. Um, so th this, uh, this piece fell dead born from the foundry um, because the Edinburgh Fine, in their wisdom, said, David Hume would never have worn a toga. And I'm thinking, oh yes, it was a packed week. I was doing a statue of Cicero and I dressed him in wig, jabot and breeches. You see, this is, what do they think we're doing? Now, the Americans, the Americans understood it perfectly. No problem at all because they're much more advanced than we are. Still having something of the Victorian in them. And this is my daughter Iona and her boyfriend. And she does three days a week with me, giving it the family. And that's... Adam Smith there, and this is the top half of Aristotle being prepared up. You can see how sharp it, the face has become for the foundry in the north of Scotland. Well, I remember we saw him in the pile of rubble. This is the second last quote. Uh, we saw him in the rubble. Remember the pile of heap of broken images? Well, they got his head, they found it on the Acropolis wreck. And the, some of the most Brilliant art, art, architecture and uh, sculpture scholars have looked at this work here. This work here, it's called The Critian Boy. And they reckon that the work was vandalised at the time of its making. Because the head, it's been repaired by the same artist that cut the rest of it. And I've got this theory that Critios has finished the object and it was such a voodoo spell that was coming off that somebody just marched into the room and smashed the head off it. They had to make it again. This is about 480 BC. A hundred years before, we were doing this work here. So within a hundred years, we went from the proclaimers here to something that maybe promises the Apollo Belvedere down the road. It's a marvelous time when the innocent and naive approach came. But at what cost? You look at this and there is something preternatural and outlandish about where it's going. The impertinence with which it assumes to copy Mother Nature's effect. Now, to demonstrate to you in cinematic terms just how horrifying that effect of imitation can be, it's from Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, where the girl, in the, the late Joan Coffer figure in the wheelchair is uh, getting her dinner served up to her by the Betty Davis figure, who is Baby Jane. She's a redundant, superannuated child star. Her sister, the Joan Crawford figure, had been overshadowed and... Um, in, the, in, her, in her childhood. And then she, she grew up to be a famous actress where baby Jane, the child actress, faded away. Now, baby Jane is looking after her and bringing her dinner. And she says, what was that, the sounds of those noises downstairs? And oh, she said, Betty Davis says, just that nosy Mrs. So-and-so next door going on about that picture of yours that you showed that they showed on the television the other night. And the Joan Crawford figure goes, oh, she said, did she like it? And Betty Davis says, oh, did she like it? It's absolutely, look it up on YouTube. It's absolutely the most terrifying thing in the world. And do you remember at school when people used to do this to you? They would take your words and then recite them back to you verbatim with a slight tweak of sarcasm or style. I think this is where sculptors go wrong. Anyway, I'm going to finish it at th on that heap of stony rubbish. Thank you for your attention. Phew. Sandy, it was amazing. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't quite know where to, where to start. And I'm almost inclined to turn to Paul and ask him to start. Um, <clears throat> can I ask you just one thing? I mean, you've got a wonderful sense of the absurd. Uh, which comes out of what you say. I mean, you, you, you find this is absurd, crazy, um, upsetting, whatever it might be. Um, do, you, do you see any... Is it, well, the thing I remember most of what you said is, is that the, the comedian must not be exactly the mimic. Uh -huh. And you said that, I think, of, of a statue as well. Uh -huh. um, 
would you take it any further? I mean, do you see any point at all in unrepresentative sculpture? But, um, this, the, the arabesque work, uh, decorative carving, the decorative tradition is very good at handling that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't like buildings that are described as sculptural. We can tell one thing from that. It's got no sculpture on it at all. <laughs> this can be said as, as a consequence of the advent of the abstractionists like Henry, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, these people, Archipenko, <clears throat> and the Russian constructivists. So suddenly a building can become sculptural, which just means that it looks weird. It should be called sculpitecture, <laughs> odious by name and odious by nature. So, uh, I always think that the main task of the artist is to represent, represent the image, to affront it, to affront nature. Our fight is against nature, you see. Arabur, uh, you know, Eastman's uh, book. And we're, we're living in a very naturalized society now. You know, Attenborough is God, or, or at least the Pope. And um, we've got to, marvel at the miracles of nature and science. Uh, we, we have also a very, very headlong process of human rewilding going on. And I won't say anything because I'm sure to offend many people if I, if I do articulate the characteristics of human rewilding. But just think of Tacitus going into Germany. Um, so making sculpture at its most dangerous and most powerful and most morally functional is when we come to represent the world, the animal world above all, which includes us. So Henry Moore means nothing to you? Or well, does he do anything to you? I used to admire him when I was young and I had, I had a plot to, with my friend Tom to go and visit him. He wouldn't have given us the time of day, I don't suppose. But, um, I always felt that Henry Moore was questionable because he made a he made ex cathedra announcements. <laughs> Look who's talking. Um, he made ex cathedra announcements about the way that the Greeks got it all wrong. You see, he said the Greeks didn't understand their material marble. They had to put a tree trunk up beside the figure to support it. Uh, that's why they put the tree trunk there because they did understand the material. Anyway, there's not much to understand in marble. It's not exactly rocket science. So uh, this is a, an announcement that he makes to, to discredit the entire Greco-Roman tradition. And he does it, he solves the problem that the Greeks never saw by making lumpen, hyper-distorted, non-prosecutive images, because nature doesn't feel at all threatened by Henry Moore. You know, but nature does feel a bit threatened by that critian boy coming along there. Because nature's being eyeballed and we don't like to be eyeballed. The Hindus say this, all mischief begins with the eye. And th that's what the mischief that the artist is involved in. The sculptor in particular is guilty of this because where the painter makes an image of a cow in a field, but he makes it and he constructs its own space through the wall in the picture. The sculptor makes this imitation and plants it right in the middle of our zone meaning that you can't ever go there. The statue overcomes space and time. So that's why I've been so devoted to making monuments, em embassies of the dead in the middle of the living. Paul. Well, here space and time becomes one, I suppose. That's it. Um, that's for a reference. Um, and that's, that's the interesting thing, I think, about what you said uh, this evening. And in fact, what you've written about before is this stillness. Um, if you look back, there's always been this objection, I think, to sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at 18th, 19th century writers, Byron, mm -hmm. uh, Dickens, Eliot are very suspicious of it, uh, comparing it socially, this idea of stillness, of restriction, mm -hmm. at a time when restriction was something to fight against. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Scruton, of course, was always concerned about this radicalization of, of, of beauty, that it empowered people, that it radicalized people. Mm -hmm. And so we have a different uh, problem than was faced by the likes of Dickens there in this, in this constricted Victorian world. What now the, the, the sculpture seems to be, when you talk about this placed in a place, is this stillness. 
in an over-animated, you know, crazed world of constant motion, of constant animation, that that becomes itself a radical idea of stillness and, and contemplation. And, and that seems to be one of the most radical acts. I mean, you know, you've just mentioned Parsifal, for example. One of the revolutionary things about Wagner, for example, in, in, in terms of what he does, is I think nothing, almost nothing happens in his operas. That's right. And that's one of the things that I think people don't understand. And that's why they remain so radical to us today. You know, you can look at a ring cycle, 14 and a half hours, whatever, 13 and a half hours of it, nothing happens at all. It's people conversing about what happened before, what's going to happen in the yeah. future, and what might happen now. And that's what makes it so radical. And I think that's what makes sculpture so radical now in this particular moment is that stillness, is that lack of, lack of motion, and perhaps above all, it's silence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And um, this is why people take against Buddha's like Bamayan. It's nothing to do with its uh, religious connotation. It's to do with the stillness of it all. The statue of Jesus in Copenhagen, the Vorfruerkirche, that Torvaldsen made, you're the one that he stands with his arms out and it says, Cover till my come to me. It's a marvelous thing. And then the activists are always screaming at this statue. And it's because of its stillness and because of its whiteness. Now, in some cultures, white is the color of mourning. Uh, but what above all it is, is the, it's the color of death. Because we, that's why sometimes these angry people that ask about color in sculpture, they want the color to be there to put color into its cheeks. I think in the end, it's an adolescent fear of death that, that, that we're dealing with here. That the will to live is so strong that we take umbrage at this parody of existence in, that stands there as a statue. It looks like the thing. It's the right shape, it's recognizable. But it only does one thing. It only looks a certain way. It doesn't taste a certain way or smell. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything and it doesn't move. What above all, I mean, Aristotle said this, that life was embodied primarily in movement. So, and this is correct. If somebody's lying on the floor there and you rush up and all you want to see them do is <clears throat> like that, and you think, oh, thank goodness, they're still alive. So what we're looking for is movement on Mars so that we lift up a rock and we see a whole lot of things scuttling. Then we know we're alive. So the monument, or the uh, statue at least, statues are sculptures, but not all sculptures are statues. All statues are sculptures. You've got to remember that. Um, so what we're looking for um, in, when we deliberately put up these stationary objects is in some way to cock a snook at the will to live. This is my Schopenhauerian background that, that's been so powerful in, in everything I've ever done. It is an absolute radical revelation here. I mean, I, people time their watches by the, when I mention it of an evening. Um, you know, but let's speak away. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, he did the most radical uh, overhaul, always, of course, hand in hand with the wisdom of the East. He was the first to bring that through. He thought the Upanishads and the, the Buddhist scriptures were just second to none. And he was very fascinated by the life-resistant nature of these teachings. And we find it in true Christianity as well. That's why it's so very difficult to get young men to go to church, and especially to close their eyes when the prayers are on, because they're always on the watch, being on the Serengeti, essentially. And then this is what happens in art. This is what makes high art music, symphonic tradition music, so difficult for the young who are so indentured to the will to live, the spirit of thrusting, so difficult for them. See, a chap in New York who was in charge of the subways in the 70s realized it was very, very dangerous. So he decided to sort the problem by playing Mozart through the Tannoy system. The thugs ran for their lives. Mm. Yep. And that's what you should do when you've got a riot. Water cannon, it, it, you're playing at it. Because it's water cannon they expect. What you want to do is hit them with malar. They'll scar, but trouble is the police will run away too. <laughs> um, and, but the thing is, and this is exactly it, it, it people cannot th thole it because it's a lullaby effect. Um, you know, we're talking about Wagner. I've always, I think he's the greatest artist that ever lived. 
of okay. all the arts. But when I go to hear a performance of it, I fight sleep. Mm. It's, it's the most unbelievable, powerful thing. And this is what Nietzsche knew. When Nietzsche was about to chuck Wagner, you know how you have to chuck your masters? Um, he was looking for an excuse to do this. And at Bayreuth, he was in the stalls, two ladies are in front of him. The music for Lohengrin, the prelude comes, you know, that legless, high, rarefied, stratospheric music. It comes in. And the lady leaned across her companion and said, this is quite the kind of music one could fall asleep to. And ne stupid Nietzsche, it, it's the facial hair talking. He went, aha, Wagner's boring, he puts you to sleep. Yes, that's the point, Fritz. Uh, you know, that's what we're meant to be doing here. We're, we're being put to sleep. Now, I was interested by what you said about um, the relationship with the visual arts in Scotland and Presbyterianism. Because uh -huh. uh, I thought about that from an English perspective there as well, um, where there seems to be more of a tension, uh, perhaps because of the duality of religious traditions in in England, so you still have a high church. I mean, you know, for goodness sake, we've ordered a civil war over these things, you know, and, and then survived. How do you see that difference between the English tradition and the Scottish tradition in terms of the religious influence on art? It's very really interesting. It's, it, it's contradictory. In the 19th century, Scotland's sculpture really started. It had stonemasons that were cutting away without preparatory models. They were, you know, the artisan tradition. They're all pretty crude looking, uh, if charming. But by the 19th century, early 19th century, it suddenly dawned on the Scots that the way to make statuary wasn't to get a block of stone and carve it out. It was to make a clay model, a clay model. And if you get that done, then you can get an accurate image made in the stone by means of mechanical measurement through. Right? That's the only way you can do this, unless you want to carve a Henry Moore. But then error doesn't show up in a Henry Moore. You, you never make a Henry Moore that one tiny slip of, 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 of the forehead makes the figure look as though it's suffering a bowel cramp. Mm -hmm. It will never happen in Moore, right? So uh, they, they, they learn to do this. And at that time, there's a great religious revival. <laughs> the disruption of the Church of Scotland that I mentioned, which was a radical, if enlightenment, Presbyterianism that was harking back to the time of the Civil War and the covenanting tradition, which was the great schism in the 1600s in Scotland. That really was a, the killing times, as they called them. But when the 19th century um, revival of this kind of theology, at least, comes out, we get actually a, a great increase in the making of sculpture in Scotland and so many of the artists, sculptors among them, are actually bought into that ecclesiastical revolution. And this is why we've got such a flowering of architecture of the neoclassical sort that continues on and on because you see it's the Old Testament in Christianity over the new and it's Greek classicism over the later Gothic, right? So that's why we're still building classical buildings in the 90, 1890s in Scotland, um, when it really ceased more or less in England. Well, it was always well, going, of course, but... It's comparable to the north of England. Yes, yes, that's right. It is contemporaneous yeah. with that. So we have great sculptors like Sir John Steele, the National Sculptor of Scotland, and Alexander Handyside Ritchie. They're decorating buildings in Edinburgh. He was a pupil of Torvaldson. And they're all friends with folk like Hugh Miller, you know, the geologist and, and a folklorist and also the uh, editor of The Witness, which was the magazine or newspaper of the disruption. And they're very much modern artists with a liberal view. The Emancipation of the Catholics, for instance, they believe in this, and they build great buildings like Greek Thompson, you know, Alexander Greek Thompson's buildings in Glasgow. It's all part of that culture. St. Vincent Street Church, really essentially trying to rebuild the Temple of Solomon according to the scriptural references. So we have a very strong Sabbatarian culture in Scotland, and it's something that I personally benefited from that day, one day of the week where you're bored senseless. You know, what a mental invention it occurs, it occurs in that sort of void. Up in Wick. 
I, I thought that emerged um, from the sort of Athens of the North tradition, yeah. the Enlightenment, um, the, 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 almost the rationalism. Um, and, and it was it also very important that it was different from England. It was very different. I mean, England was Palladian, Scotland was Greek, and um, the whole... That's right. We, we go for the Grecian style. Um, the Athens of the North, of course. Well, you see, that moniker was on Edinburgh long before the discovery of Athens. And it was discovered on account of the number of men of men of genius that you could meet in one morning um, at a certain crossing in the city. Edinburgh could have been as flat as Rotterdam. It was still been called the Athens of the North. It's because of this quota of genius. Then some travellers go into the Ottoman Empire and find this wee pokey provincial town called Athens. And blow me, it just looks like Edinburgh. It's got the Areopagus, that's the, the, the uh, Colton Hill. It's got the Acropolis, that's the Castle Hill. It's got the Piraeus, that's Leith. <laughs> and suddenly the picturesque movement starts to work. So, the, so then it becomes the Athens of the North perceptually, not merely conceptually. Are you, are you going to complete, I mean, you, you clearly have a problem with, um, with uh, ruins or ruination, and you, 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 in some sense you'd like it to be completed. Are you, are you in favour of re, re, completing Playfair's um, yeah, the, um, Acropolis? The, the, Nap yeah. the Napoleonic Monument, it was, mm. a, yeah. Well, you see, nowadays that's become a shibboleth. They all love it because it's not completed. I won't spoil their party in a way. <laughs> Just make the entire complex. You, you, you've got the Parthenon marbles to get, get stuck into. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, oh, keep on um, Yeah, you're, you seem to um, have uh, an alternative canon. Uh, I think a Torvaldson here is relatively uh, neglected, at least compared mm. to you know, the, um, the standard canon here. I mean, how do you create that canon? I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Is, it, is there a measure for that canon? Well, Torvaldson is particular. I don't know. I mean, folk don't know about Torvaldson. He died in 1844, the most famous artist alive. Walter Scott was dead. Richard Wagner was yet to happen. Nietzsche was just born in, in 1844. So there was a point at which the most famous artist alive was a sculptor. And the previous incumbent to that position who died in 1822, was also a sculptor, Antonio Canova, both neoclassical sculptors. So the beginning of the 19th century is the century of sculptural development, like nothing on earth. Very different. Canova's still ba basking in the fading rays of the Baroque sunset. Whereas Torvaldson, he's going for an attic shape, something more Grecian. The surfaces won't be lustrous and highly polished. They'll have scratch surfaces. The outlines will be absolutely stupendous and the work in relief will reach a, a, a summit, something that Canova was never good at, relief work. Canova was not a great designer, but Torvaldson could design beautifully. So I, I fell in love with it. I went to, to Copenhagen where the, the museum, you know, his works are, are stored in the great Torvaldson Museum. And I was a student. I was looking for a, a letter written by Alexander Handyside Ritchie to Torvaldson in their library. And it was for what research I was doing, you know? Sorry, research I was doing. And um, I never found the letter because it was a sculpture that just took over. And it was Torvaldson that released me from the fatuity of the Rodanesque line. I thought, I can manage Rodin, but this is beyond me. And that's what you always try to do, the thing you can't manage. Mm -hmm. I've found that there's a the Torvaldson test. <clears throat> and there's certain people of a certain moral disposition can't stand the sight of it. And it's because it exudes a Biedermeyer quality of pure buttermilk goodness. Whereas in Canova, there's an aspect of the carnal sublime. Um, Horvaldson's work is childlike, innocent and sweet. Able to ally sweetness with power, which is what Walter Pater said was great about Michelangelo. I think there's more power than sweetness in Michelangelo. But with Thorvaldson, it's, it's typified by rosy-fingered dawn, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and 
Um, when you go and look at the tour guides for Copenhagen, Lonely Planet, is it? One of these? Yep. Oh, you'll be recommended not to go to the Torvalds Museum. Oh, no, all that ghastly, livid, white, neoclassical, uh, devoid of atmosphere, of passion. And the antidote to the Torvalds Museum, the official government antidote of the Danes, they're the most happiest people on earth, mind you, is that awful museum called Louisiana, just up the shore. It stinks of rotten carpet, and it's full of the most righteous bits of modern sculpture with sight lines in it. Um, you said uh, you do quite a lot of work in the United States, mm -hmm. Sandy. Um, and I think of the classical tradition there, which I suppose goes back to Jefferson Monticello, which mm -hmm. of course has mm -hmm. its issues now among uh, certain constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, is that a different kind of classicism there that, 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 that is rooted in the United States? Yeah. It's Italianate. And why are they more receptive? Yeah, if it's they Italianate are and basically, you're allowed to do classical work over there. It's illegal here, more or less. Um, it, some planning authorities will not allow it. Certain shapes are illegal, isn't that weird? <laughs> anyway, um, in America, it's absolutely bound in with the very being, as you know, the infant republic. Yeah. Is, is absolutely bound in with the Greek and Greek or Roman. There was a discussion about what the official language of America should be, and ancient Greek was tabled as an option. It'd be a very different world. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so they were acutely conscious that to be proper revolutionaries, they have to look backwards, backward looking. You know, the way you row a boat, you can do it really well if you're going backwards. If you try to row a boat forwards, it's chaos. It's really hopeless. So they look back to Cincinnatus and ancient Republican Rome, and they look back to the Greeks as well, and, and against the tyrants of Persia and all, all this kind of thing. Oratory or rhetoric is at the absolute core of the revolution. That's why when you go to America, you've got to have inscriptions everywhere. It's so noisy, but they must have it. Uh, the problem is, in, in the modern age, uh, your, your client, if you're an architect, your client will be used to go to Italy on holiday and will love to see Italian architecture. Thus, the Palladian gets an extra boost. So he wants for his daughter's prom that she should appear out of the piano nobile with a set of steps to go down. Do you understand what I mean? Now, the... The trouble with America is it completely ignores all the other classicisms. So I would like to take them to Copenhagen to see Hack Campman's police headquarters. That's a building that's cold as a stepmother's kiss. At 1920s, it was done absolutely stupendous thing. It's stripped Nordic neoclassicism. It's uh, properly Spartan. But they don't want to go to Copenhagen for their holidays. See, so that's, that's a problem that we have. The American 20th century architectural tradition has been absolutely fabulous with the Art Deco movement, the skyscrapers and uh, all that stuff, and you know the Prairie Deco, as it's sometimes called, Nebraska State Capitol and these things. But they don't seem, the client body doesn't seem to be aware of this. It's interesting. So we struggle with that, but we're trying to push it forward a wee bit to say, look, look at yourselves, what you did way back. Andy, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>